Kiara Koto. Welcome to the second talk in the Biosecurity Bonanza for 2021. Thank you for joining us. Today's speaker is Dr. Grant Norbury, who's a wildlife ecologist with Menaki Fenua, based down at our Alexandra office. Grant has worked in Central Otago on many wildlife projects, particularly those involving predator-prey interactions, and he currently leads Menaki Fenua's research on predator-free projects throughout New Zealand. Grant's talk today is on the use of misinformation tactics to protect rare birds from problem predators, and that's based on field work done in recent years, primarily in the Mackenzie Basin. As Tiffany said, following Grant's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session, so I encourage you to type in questions as we go. We'll try and get to all of those questions today. If we run out of time, Grant will respond by email after the presentation. I'll hand over Grant. I'll hand over to Grant now for his presentation. Thanks, Grant. Uh, kia ora koto. Thank you, Grant, and thanks everyone for coming to this presentation. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a non-lethal option for reducing unwanted predation using myth misinformation tactics for fooling predators into thinking that prey are not worth pursuing. Now, as we all know, introduced predators cause significant conservation problems worldwide, especially in Australia, New Zealand and the wider Pacific. Uh, but sometimes predators are also native to an area that can cause problems, such as raccoons uh, preying on turtle nests in North America. In cases like this, non-lethal options are particularly important. In New Zealand, we're very focused on lethal control and for good reason, as it often leads to very good outcomes and it's especially useful over landscape scales in the case of toxins. Uh, but we don't always have the license to operate lethal methods. For example, in and around urban and farmed areas. Also, lethal control can sometimes lead to increases in non-target predators, for example, rodents that were previously suppressed by top order predators, thereby creating another kind of unwanted predation. Now, we're all very aware of the national goal of predator eradication by 2050. Uh, whether we get there or not, I think most of us would agree that we need to keep our options open and continue to explore alternatives to lethal eradication. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about one such alternative based on optimal foraging theory. Predators have to negotiate environments that are information rich and make constant foraging decisions. They have to learn to focus on prey cues that reliably predict available prey and ignore those that do not. Information that's useless or unrewarding is filtered into the perceptual background and ignored thereafter. These learning and foraging behaviours offer new opportunities to reduce biodiversity loss. The key thing here is that mammalian predators rely primarily on smell to detect food from a distance. They do this before other cues are useful. This odour detection usually happens well before predators actually encounter prey and consume them. So odour is therefore crucial information we can interfere with. In the experiment I'm about to show you, we used unrewarded odour to create misinformation about the value of prey. The idea is based on work by our collaborators, Catherine Price and Peter Banks from the University of Sydney. They studied rat predation of artificial nests on a small scale in a forest near Sydney. They primed areas with feathers and faeces from quail and found that nests in treated areas had 60% greater survival than those that did not. That is, they habituated rats to bird odour. Now, it's unknown whether this simple manipulation could deceive multiple predator species in complex environments into ignoring available natural prey and deliver population scale benefits. So in collaboration with Catherine and Peter, we tested this approach on native birds in the Mackenzie Basin of the South Island, where predators or predation studies had been done for many years.
This is a banded dotterel, by the way, which is one of the main species we worked on. So we asked the question, before birds arrive to breed, could we use unrewarded prey odor cues to habituate predators and make them ignore real prey cues? This is the habituation phase. When the prey arrive for breeding and we continue deploying unrewarded odour, could we increase predators' foraging costs and make them miss real prey as their cues would be camouflaged amongst the unrewarded cues? This is what we call the camouflage phase. It's important to note here that the prey we're trying to protect are not the primary food source for predators. They have to be secondary prey so that the cost to predators of giving up on these prey is not too high. So five years ago, we tested this approach on braided river systems of the Mackenzie Basin, shown in the top left uh, graph here, graphic here. The three bird species we worked with were mostly double-banded plover or banded dotterel, but the other birds we worked with as well were the ryebill and the South Island pied oyster catcher. The three main predator species were feral cats, hedgehogs and ferrets, all seen raiding nests here. The proportion of nest predations by each species is shown. This is without any treatment effects here. It was highly variable between sites, but note the very high value for hedgehogs. They accounted for over half of the nest predations. Now remember the eggs here are secondary prey. Cats and ferrets rely primarily on rabbits as their food source, and hedgehogs rely primarily on invertebrates. We extracted odour from feathers or whole carcasses of chicken and quail, which we obtained commercially, and from blackback gulls from culling operations. We used a simple solvent extraction method in the lab. Dry fatty triglyceride material was combined with Vaseline in a 10% concentration on average and transferred to plastic syringes and stored at minus 20 degrees C until they were required. Before the field experiments, we did some lab and pen trials to make sure we could induce habituation to unrewarded odour. We tested mice in the lab as a model animal species and ferrets and hedgehogs in outdoor pens. All three species habituated. But this was the easy part. The more difficult task was ensuring that predators generalised bird odours so that when they smell native birds, they perceive them as bird. That is, they're similar enough to chicken, quail and go, gull, so they don't bother pursuing native birds. That's a fundamental um, part of the whole process. We found that generalisation was more variable among individuals than habituation, and that ferrets generalised more than hedgehogs. And here's uh, the publication from that work in Ecological Applications. For the field experiment, we chose four sections of riverbed and their outer margins along the Lake Tekapo catchment and drainage system. Each site was about six kilometres in length and about a thousand hectares each. We matched treatments and controls according to altitude and habitat type so that the bottom two sites were matched, as were the top two sites. We deployed bird odour for about five weeks on average before nesting began, that's the habituation phase, and we continued deploying odour for seven weeks thereafter, the so-called camouflage phase. And in, year, in the second year of the study, we swapped the treatments and controls to increase the robustness of the design. Here's an example of odour deployment on the Cass River Delta. Every three days, we deployed odour at 300 to 400 random points, and we re-randomised those on every occasion. We didn't know how many points would be required to generate an effect, so Cecilia Latham modelled encounter rates by predators based on their movement rates 
and the known probability of a predator interacting with a prey lure. And those two aspects are published for most of the predators we're dealing with. And here's the modelling paper for those that are interested. The modelling estimated that ferrets, for example, would encounter up to 77 odour points over a 27 day period, which we thought would be sufficient to generate habituation. So at every random point, we smeared 0.1 to 0.2 mils of the Vaseline matrix on rocks or twigs if there are no rocks. And if it was just a grassy system, we actually took small rocks with us and smeared rock on uh, Vaseline onto those. So we had the peculiar situation of scientists walking around with rubber gloves and syringes trying to stop predators eating birds' eggs, which tended to raise a few eyebrows, as you can imagine a pretty left of field method. We wanted to make sure that predators became habituated to the odour before the birds arrived to nest in September. So we deployed cameras at 40 odour points on each treatment site and we re-randomised those every six days. And here you can see a cat, hedgehog and ferret sniffing bird odour smeared on rocks. So this is what we expected to find. After deploying odour before nesting began, we expected predators' interest in the odour to decline because there were no food rewards. That's the habituation phase. Then as birds started nesting and we continued deploying odour, interest in odour would remain low but now nests are being camouflaged to some extent as their scent is mingled amongst the unrewarded odour, thereby confusing predators. In terms of hatching success, we know it's very low when predators hunt normally, that's with no odour. But we expected higher nesting success with the odour treatments, and we also expected it to decline slowly as predators gradually encountered real nests and re-engaged their normal hunting behaviour. So here are some results. This is the habituation curves for ferrets and cats that we measured in the field. This is their interactions with odour. The x-axis shows days since the start of odour deployment and the y-axis is the total interaction times with those odour points. The tiny blue bars there are controls, their interactions where no odour was placed on rocks and there's almost no interest in those. And you can see that ferrets and cats were very interested at the start of the deployment, but they lost most of that interest over about a one to two week period. So we're happy with that. What about hedgehogs? Very different profile. Hedgehogs were uh, hibernating at the start of the project. And you can see that I've indicated the start of hedgehog emergence. So when they're emerging, hedgehogs are very hungry and they're out looking for food. And so they're Interaction rates actually increased at a, at a high point there, but you can see it did rapidly decline again, suggesting habituation. In terms of uh, nest survival, we had a team of ornithologists led by Nikki MacArthur measuring nest survival using cameras. And here's a camera pointing at a pied oyster egg, pied oyster eggs shown in the red circle there. And uh, we did a power analysis showing that we needed to monitor about 60 nests at each site. We ended up monitoring 51 to 64 nests at each site. So over the whole study, we monitored the fate of 470 nests across four sites and two seasons. So it was a pretty robust data set. So here's the results for hatching success of banded dotterels and ribills combined. Most of the data are actually uh, banded dotterels. Uh, and this, the data I'm showing you here is for the two match sites shown in the circle on the map. Cecilia modelled hatching success based on daily survival rate in program mark and maximum likelihood fit of the best model using AIC. So these are predicted hatching successes from the best model. Red is with odour, blue is without odour. You can see there was greater hatching success with the odour. Treatment effects waned and the effect lasted for about 25 days. That's when we started to see the confidence intervals overlapping. But the other two sites shown on the map here, up the top there, 
uh, bird productivity was higher on those sites, but the treatment effects were similar. And again, there was about a 25 day effective treatment period. What about pied oyster catchers? The data was similar. Here the sites are combined, given that there were fewer nests monitored for pied oyster catchers. In this case, the effective treatment period was longer at about 35 days. So overall, these results show that compared with non-treated sites, chick production over a 25 to 35 day period almost doubled on the treated sites and the odds of success, successful hatching more than doubled. But does, does this increased nesting success translate to population increase? We combined our observed hatching success data with known life history parameters for banded dotrels because they're the best studied species. And Cecilia used program Vortex to predict dotrel numbers over 25 years from a starting population of 1,000 birds. With the current low rates of nesting success without any management, dotrel numbers were predicted to decline. And that's exactly what dotrel population monitoring is showing around New Zealand. With the odour treatments, however, applied every year, the model predicted a 127% increase in populations over the same period. So we're pretty happy with that and somewhat surprised with these results. The method's an entirely new approach for reducing unwanted predation, but is it any better than conventional lethal control? Cost comparisons are difficult because they're so context specific, although they are broadly similar at about $33 per hectare, that includes odour extraction applied over a 66 day period from the start of deployment of the odour to the end of that effective treatment period. But this method could be used where lethal methods are ineffective, where there are social limit limitations that prevent their use, or where there are native predators causing unwanted predation and so they can't be lethally controlled. And the method won't result in ecological release of herbivores such as rabbits or mesopredators such as rodents or create compensatory reinvasion into controlled areas. Both are common consequences of lethal control. So it's most suited to small or elongated areas prone to high rates of reinvasion. Re um, there are three basic conditions necessary for the method to work. One of them is that the predators must be generalist predators with access to alternative high value food, that the prey are secondary prey, and that they're visually and auditorily cryptic. If they're too uh, loud and too spectacular in their, in, their, in, their, in their visual aspects, then predators will be attracted to those cues. So we don't want that. And it's also most likely to work over relatively short periods when the prey are most vulnerable. For example, the early phase of breeding, or translocations, during translocations. And a commonly asked question is whether this method will make predators switch to other prey types that we may not want them to consume. We don't think that'll be the case because we'd imagine it'll be far easier for a predator to, co to compensate for loss of a particular secondary prey species by increasing their consumption of primary prey if their nutritional demands require it, rather than them searching out another kind of secondary prey which is more costly. Uh, so that's it from me. Thanks for listening. I want to acknowledge my colleagues in, these, in this work, and that's Catherine Price and Peter, Peter Banks from the University of Sydney, Cecilia Latham, Sam Brown, Dave Latham, Gretchen Brownstein, and Hayley Ricardo from Monarchy Fenua, and Nikki MacArthur, formerly from Wildlife Management International, and a whole bunch of other people here for planning and support, preparation of bird odour, field work, nest monitoring, and access to field sites and our funders, which was uh, the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment Smart Ideas Grant. If you'd like further details, you can email me at that address, or you could email Kath or Peter at the University of Sydney. And uh, there's the URL of the published experiment I've just been talking about, where you can download the PDF for free. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Grant. That's a fantastic study, and it's great to hear uh, you know, how that's developed over the years and that you've got that out into publications. We have plenty of time for questions, so I encourage you to uh, go over to the taskbar if you have anything you'd like to ask. Um, I'll actually kick off, Grant. Uh, 
you talked about the modeling of how many of the odor stations the animals as they roamed around would encounter do you have any does that modeling shed any light on how many the the nests they would encounter that they would just kind of stumble over without using odor cues um <clears throat> How many nests that they would normally encounter? Is well, I'm just you thinking, mean? you know, even though they uh, they couldn't rely on odor cues, if they got close enough, presumably they would see something. Yes. So I just wonder if you have any sense of how close they have to get. Uh, don't really know that. We don't really know the sphere of capture from odor. You know, how far away is an animal attracted from an odor source? That's a really interesting thing we need to understand actually for, for lures in general. Um, but uh, in, in, in theory, the interaction with bird nests would be somewhat similar, I would have thought, that if the modelling would suggest something similar because the modelling is based on how rapidly and how far animals are moving and their interaction rates with prey lures. So okay. we just took that, yeah. So I would have thought it's probably similar for nests. I think okay. that's a question, I'm not sure, Graham. Uh, okay, we've got a bunch of questions, now I've got to catch up. Um, do you think there might be long-term learning of the misinformation by the predators and, and that would result in less predation even without odor lures? Um, long-term learning. So the idea really that don't. this effect this effect you know, might persist even after you stop putting out those misinformation yeah. lures. Yeah, it's a, it's unknown. It, it really is unknown whether they will, you see that they eventually find out that they've been fooled because they encounter a real nest. So it's game over for those individuals. Uh, so I would expect there not to be any uh, carryover effect because they've already cons consumed real prey. The question is, is that particular, are those individuals vulnerable to this method the following season? And that's an unknown. I'd imagine that they would be actually, that they would be vulnerable to it. And also the predators we're dealing with aren't particularly long lived either. Um, so you, you're dealing with new new recruits all the time. Right. That'll, that'll be vulnerable to the method. Okay. Uh, would real prey odor source work better, I guess, from the native species yeah. themselves, or yeah. that would presumably be a nightmare, nightmare to get approval for the approach? Yes, it would be. And we, in fact, we tried that. Um, it was difficult. <laughs> um, it, and it is a difficult process. To get odor from real prey is just hard work. Um, and it's, it's much more convenient to be able to get commercially available odour. And in fact, what we want on that subject, we want to actually manufacture bird odour in the lab so that we don't have to extract it from birds and therefore it makes it cheaper and easier, more available. Um, so uh, I think what's important here is that you want a mixture of species, no matter what it is. I think if you uh, put all your eggs in one basket of, of one particular prey species you're trying to protect, uh, it loses the universality or the generalizability of the method. I think you want to provide a range of bird odors uh, in this case to generalize the effect, I guess. Yeah. 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 And a follow on question to that, are you thinking of making odor lures commercially available? Yeah, that's, that's what I was saying. Um, we really want to do this. Uh, we want to manufacture bird odor in the lab. Um, a uh, colleague of ours, Patrick Garvey, is trying to do the same thing with ferret body odour as a lure for predators. Uh, and it is doable. Uh, it is doable. We, we want to get to that stage at some point. So I've had some interest from people around New Zealand and the world, actually. Where do we get the bird odour from? And all I can say at this stage is um, we can make it for you in the lab or you could do it yourself. And it, it's it's not that complex, but it's just clunky. It would be easy to buy a little vial off the shelf. Yeah. Okay, another question. Uh, how could rabbit control impact on the success of this approach in a year that rabbit numbers go down significantly? Uh, well, rabbit control is a really good means of, um, of, 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 of managing predators full stop you know, for those predators that are reliant on rabbits as a primary food source. So that's a, 
it's, it, that's a bottom-up approach to try and reduce predator numbers is to remove remove their main prey source. So yeah, I'm, I'm always an advocate for that. Um, and that'll remove a lot of predators um, before you you could perhaps implement this method. Um, yeah, so kind of a, a, a multi-pronged approach. Yes, a multi-pronged approach. Um, the, the, the fallacy of that is if you're removing animals with rabbit control, you're left with a residual number of predators that are probably more specialist on secondary prey. And if that's the case, then the misinformation tactic might be a little less useful. Right. Anyway, interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hedgehogs primary prey are invertebrates. So could this method have negative effects on rare endangered native invertebrates in the area? Um, um, it's a it's an unknown. It, it it's an unknown that one. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I I would have thought that if if the that the uh, given the biomass of invertebrates and all the other kinds of invertebrates that are out there that aren't threatened, that's what a hedgehog would do if it can't get to eggs. It's going to go for another kind of invertebrate that's not so vulnerable. That'd be a lot easier for a hedgehog to do than to increase the predation of a rarer, a rarer species. But yeah, interesting point. Definitely something to think about. Uh, yeah. Do you think this technique might be effective in urban restoration projects? There are lots of predator-free programs in cities these days. Yeah, 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 I do. Um, potentially, yes. You know, small areas where you can uh, put out odor on a on a where it's logistically easy to detect a localized source of prey that you're worried about. Um, yes, particularly in urban, because you're not having to kill any animal and set poisons and um, traps so I think it's probably uh, quite useful for that context potentially. The thing is it needs to be tested in a range of other systems that's the what we need so if people are keen to test it in their patch would be very interested. Uh, are you getting interest in this from overseas? This is my question but um, it would seem to have a lot of applications in places where the predators themselves are valued species. Yes, and we are. Yep, we are getting some interest. Um, that that's the thing we deal with. The, down here, uh, especially in New Zealand, anything that's a mammalian predator, we want to get rid of them. Basically, it's easy for us. But in overseas, um, they have native predators that cause lots of problems, and they can't. Lethal control isn't an option, so they are really looking for non-lethal options. Um, yeah. So there, there is quite a lot of interest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> questions are flooding in. I'm having to track on the screen. Oh, let's see. I just lost the one I was going to ask. Um, how does local weather impact the deployment of the odor? Do operations need to halt when there's large amounts of rain forecast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, you know, we had all sorts of weather during our experiments. You know, Mackenzie Basin, open river bread bed systems are. Phew, it can be howling wind or with snow or whatever. Yeah, if it got too bad, like snow, we obviously wouldn't do it. But um, we had a range of conditions. Um, yeah, I think it's better to have fine weather. Um, yeah, if you can. But uh, you don't want ex too extreme a weather. Otherwise, the scent will be blowing all over the place and um, it might be diminished with strong winds and so forth. Yeah. Is there a risk that using the odors long term could start attracting new predators into the area, leading to higher predation numbers long term? Yeah, we're worried about that, that we're actually going to attract predators in. So what we did was we measured predator abundance using cameras and tracking tunnels in all of the sites, treatments and non-treatments, and we didn't find that was the case, uh, which is good, well, that's good because we did, yeah, we did worry about that actually. Yeah. And actually, so, a related question: um, How does this affect nearby predator control operations? Do you recommend stopping predator control of their primary prey nearby? And if so, how would that affect the native species not involved in in your particular study area? So, is that is that 
controlling predators in areas near this method. Ne yeah, so how does it affect nearby predator control operations? Yeah. Do you recommend okay. stopping um, them? Yeah, um, uh, it, 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 well, it won't have any effect it won't have any effect. It'll it'll all help, I think, if there's ongoing predator control around an area where you're not doing lethal control. Um, I, I can't quite see how it would affect it. Maybe think about that. Um, yeah. Well, if we we can respond later if we have other thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, a couple yeah. of people have asked, how about fledging success? As the effect of the odor winds down, the chicks are fledging. Are they going to then be at risk of being predated? Yeah, that's a good question because we are only looking at, we only looked at one part of the life history stage and that was egg recruitment or chick recruitment, I guess, um, chick production. Chick survival, we've got no idea because it was a lot harder to do that. A lot of work involved in doing that. Um, so for animals that have engaged with the eggs and are into it, um, the chicks, will be vulnerable to those predators because it's back into business for them. If there are still predators out there that are being fooled by misinformation, presumably they will not pursue a chick. They smell a chick, um, they won't pursue it presumably uh, because they're still in the process of being fooled. It's, it's only for those individuals that encounter real prey where it's game over. It is an unknown, yeah. uh, the chick question, yes. Uh, did you observe any effects of the odour on the nesting birds? Did they avoid nesting near odoured rocks or preferentially ne nest near odoured rocks? No, no, there was no interaction there. So we had, as I said, we had a bunch of ornithologists doing the bird monitoring who really understood bird behaviour and they, um, they didn't see any effect of that, um, nor did they see any effect of the camera being placed in front of the nests. In their case, they camouflage the cameras really well. They put them on rock stacks, inside rock sort of piles uh, near a nest, and there was no evidence of, of interactions with um, of, of the effects of a camera being there as a lure for a predator. So that was comforting to know as well. All right, there's actually quite a few more questions here, but I'm just going to do a couple more and then Grant, maybe you can respond to some of the others by email. Okay. Uh, what about using the lures in conjunction with trapping? If bird scent yeah. becomes background noise, would that then make the lures and the traps more worthy of investigation? Oh, okay. Um, so like they could be because lures the, and the traps. Yeah, a non-bird lure and a trap. Yeah, possibly. Um, uh, um, um, Not sure how that would work. I mean, if you're being habituated to a bird odour, uh, yeah, well, maybe. Yeah, maybe, as I said, if they're, they're more likely to increase their consumption of primary prey, and if they're smelling a rabbit bait, for example, in a predator trap, maybe they would um, increase their attractiveness to that because they're not getting their eggs. Again, it's an unknown, but it's an interesting one, yeah. Uh, does it matter what kind of rocks you placed odour on? Not that we knew. Uh, we had plenty of rocks in the Mackenzie Basin, so it was pretty easy for us. Um, no, not not that we we knew. But what I said, uh, sometimes we're out in open sort of uh, marginal country, margin riverbed margins that had lots of grass on them, and we had to take little sort of pebbles about that big with us because there were no sticks, no nothing. And we just took little pebbles in a pack and smeared a bit of um, odor, odor on that and put place that down. So, yeah. yeah. And I'll just finish off. This is a, a comment rather than a question, but uh, the comment was this approach would be great for burrowing nesting birds like grey faced petrel, as stoats may give up exploring tunnels prior to nesting. Yeah. Do you agree? That's, yep. The, w yes, in theory. Yes, in theory. <laughs> Again, it'd be really good to test the method in a situation like that. Um, and well, I, really I think this, this study is a good example of, as in all of science, it actually raises lots of interesting questions that still need to get asked. But I, I think the basic point you made with the talk came through really clearly. So uh, congratulations on that study.
So okay. we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, we didn't get to all of the questions, and so Grant will have an opportunity to re respond to those. And I think his responses get posted on the website in a day or two. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in today. And uh, I hope you'll have an opportunity to come back again at two o'clock. Uh, Chris Niebuhr will be presenting on the disease toxoplasmosis and how that may or may not be cycling between livestock, wildlife, and uh, native species. So that's at two o'clock today. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you.